Hey, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Think Tech Hawaii studios for another episode of Security Matters. I hope you're all doing well out there today. I'm glad to be in here sharing some more valuable information with you today. I have a, an amazing guest. Uh, Sejal Thakkar is a subject matter expert, um, I believe legal training ninja. Um, her background uh, is illegal and I'll let her share that with you. But her, um, her passion is um, civility and respect in the workplace. And, and she's uh, got some amazing things to share with you today. Sejal, thanks so much for joining me today. I know, I know you're busy, we're all busy these days. Hi. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Andrew. This is so awesome. Thanks for having me. No, thank you. We're, we're going to get our money's worth today. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I typically let, um, I like my guests to kind of share their background and their history. And I, you know, I read, I've read yours, but um, share, you know, with our guests who may not be as familiar with sort of this line of work and, you know, your background and then, you know, your passion for how you got into it. And then of course, train extra, which is what uh, you've been doing sort of full time these days. Sure. I'd love to. Um, so just by way of a uh, quick history, I'm an employment lawyer. I've been litigating cases, primarily representing management since about 2003. And um, I've worked on all kinds of cases, but it just sort of ended up happening that I dealt a lot with sexual harassment, workplace bullying and discrimination cases. And um, I've seen all kinds of stuff happening in the workplace, you know, from insensitive comments to sexual harassment, physical touching cases. I mean, just when I, I feel like I've seen it all, another case sort of drops on my desk. And what I often wow. found happening as an attorney was rather than actually litigating the case, I was helping people kind of understand what their rights were. And this was whether I was dealing with a, a supervisor or an employee. And it became really obvious that you know, a lot of us, I mean, we spend a lot of time at work and we sometimes more than we do with our own families. And so I, I say that all the time because we really kind of take that for granted. And and I've seen employers who are well-intentioned and employees who are well-intentioned and they get themselves in these situations and really, you know, just don't know what to do. So um, one of the reasons why I stopped litigating cases and started doing training um, and then recently, a couple of years ago, I started up my own company, a proactive training company, because I really believe that we have to kind of address it differently than the way that we've been doing it. What we've been doing hasn't really worked. We've been putting bandages on things rather than kind of addressing the root cause. So my whole mission right now, and I'm, you know, I, I would love to share with the people that are watching and listening to this is really just what I believe is the way that we can kind of reduce harassment and these kind of predatory behaviors from happening in the workplace. So that's kind of what I'm well, doing right I now. Mean, let's good. Yeah. Let's, let's get into it. So let's, um, let's go, let's go with a big term that you don't see a lot. Um, civility. Um, this is a, one of those sort of basic, um, uh, what would I give it? Just a, a basic behavioral characteristic that, you sort of expect out of people in a public space, mm -hmm. like, a, like your workspace. Um, let's talk about where, where, where you've seen it come from. Maybe, maybe some ideas for how it's eroded. Um, I see a lot of what I call uncivil behavior out there just in the public space. Sure. Um, so, you know, when I stopped litigating cases, and that was about seven years ago, I pulled out all my cases that I'd worked on over the years. And I started taking a look at why did we end up in court in these cases? And ah. a couple of things like really jumped out at me. Um, one was that there was some breakdown in the communication, whether there was no communication, lack of communication, miscommunication, misunderstanding, something that had to do with communication. And then the other thing I found was that there was a lot of in, incivility going on in the workplace and that people saw it happening, but then they didn't address it properly or they didn't know what to do about it. So a lot of times they didn't say anything you know, because they feared that they'd be retaliated against, or sometimes they believed that no one would believe them, or they just weren't sure what their rights were. I mean, there's over a hundred different reasons why people don't speak up when they feel that someone's being mm. treating them, you know, badly. And so, so those were kind of the things that really jumped out at me. And then when I looked at the like numbers by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and they were, they were saying that, 
you know, nationwide, we were seeing discrimination and harassment complaints and retaliation complaints over over 76,000 complaints in 2018 and last year there was wow. you know 73,000 complaints so when i looked at this i'm like this is something needs to happen here we're not we're not addressing this the right way we you know and then i saw a lot of diversity and inclusion stuff going on um, and so you were seeing organizations saying that they were committed to diversity and inclusion and they were hiring you know their chief diversity officer chief inclusion officer and yet the complaints weren't going down and so what mm. i um the equal employment opportunity commission in 2016 they did a task force study and they they came out with this massive i think it's like over 100 page report where they basically said what we've been doing with harassment training in the workspace hasn't worked and they really outlined all these different reasons why it wasn't working. And then at the very end of it, they say that what really needs to happen is we need to start focusing in on more, creating more workspaces that are respectful and focused on civil behavior, as well as increasing bystander intervention trainings. And so that was sort of the reason why I um, started doing what I'm doing right now is because I completely understand, you know, you can, if you can't assume that when everybody comes into an organization that they're all going to know what's appropriate for the workplace and what's not. Um, mm. I, I, I think that would be naive to think that everybody knows how to behave. Right. So, so I think organizations, the, the pitch that I've been making is to organizations is look, you need to hire a chief civility officer. So that's what I call myself, right? I'm the chief civility officer of Train Extra, along with legal training ninjas. So, um, nice. and, and my thing is we need to, you need, your organization has to create civility as a core strategic value, in addition to diversity and inclusion mm -hmm. and your other values. But civility has to be a core value. You need to hire a chief civility officer. You need to put the resources, put the processes, the policies, all of that in place and teach people what you mean by civility and then communicate that, set up accountability systems and so forth. And so um, so one of the definitions then, you know, is what is civility? Because if we go, we ask 100 different people what they mean by civility, everybody's going to tell us something. Ah, different. Good. So, so the definition that I like, and um, it's it's by a doctor, her name is Cynthia Clark. She's the leading expert in the civility sort of workplace issues. And um, I pulled it out here because I wanted to definitely share this with you is this is what I use in my workshops and this is what I use during my trainings. And I obviously break it down, but she calls workplace civility is an authentic respect for others requiring time, presence, a willingness to engage in genuine discourse and an intention to seek common ground. And so yeah. then we can break those down if you wanted to, but that's sort of the definition. And I love the way she explains it and she talks about it. Um, and, and she wrote this book uh, called Civility Matters, which is a great book for anybody that's interested on this area. But so, but an organization, every organization is different um, and, and they would have to come up with their own definition, but this is just one that I, I love the elements and how it breaks it out. So, yeah. Um, do you, so I love, I love intentionality because I think that's a thing that's, that's lacking often. I, um, especially yeah. in the workplace where everybody seems hurried, like they're, they got to get something done. It's like, oh, let's, let's have this transactional conversation where I, I get what I need or I give you whatever you know, I'm trying to get the monkey off my back onto your back, whatever it may be, but it's, it's transactional without an intention of maybe understanding um, why I need this monkey off my back or, or why you may need to get something from me. And that we don't, we're not taught to engage in conversation with intentionality, uh, at least very well. And I don't think many people are familiar with that idea. Um, when you come across that element in your training sessions, is that a, do you have to take some time there with most people to get them to think about their intention in a conversation? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, we, it's, it's gotta be scenario based and I do a lot of storytelling mm. and I talk about the cases that I've worked on and, and that really seems to resonate. And one of the things that I really keep tying, try, tying this back to is, and I think this is what works in empowering everybody to be a part of the solution. Cause I never really, I never really understood it. I thought it was ridiculous that, you know, up until last year, we were only requiring that supervisors get trained on sexual harassment. I'm like, 
why how is this wow. make sense right it's not like the that. supervisors are the only one harassing people and it's not only sexual harassment it could be any kind of harassment based on any yeah. reason right um and so it, it just the system didn't wasn't set up to really get to the root cause but the way that we talk about intention intentionality and how i get people to kind of really um, feel like they can do something about it because a lot of times people actually feel like they're out of con they don't have control over the situation and so they don't want to get involved right and and the way that i kind of talk about it is look rarely is it a situation where you're going to have somebody that's going to just engage in harassing con conduct like out of the blue right it's it's usually something where you start seeing this kind of progression happen like first they're going to be rude mm. or they might make an insensitive joke or they might be a little dismissive and then they're going to see does anybody do anything about it and if they don't then they'll continue right and and then if it continues then it gets to the point where it might become unwelcome or dismissive behavior or abusive conduct bullying and then pretty soon it's illegal harassment or discrimination so i kind of wow. talk about it as a progression of behaviors and then i tell people but look if if you if somebody makes an let's say they're not even intending to harass you or, or make you feel uncomfortable they make a joke but what for whatever reason that's offensive to me because of my culture and and maybe andrew thinks it's hilarious you know and i don't and that's just because of our limited life experiences and the lens by which we view our world and so but if i don't say something to you or to that person you're going to keep thinking it's okay and you're going to keep doing it but it might not be an intentional thing but I, until i put you on notice and so this is where i tell people that they have to start speaking up they have to put people on notice even if it's not intentional because that person's until you put that person on notice they're going to keep doing it um because i can't tell you the number of cases i've worked on where you know i'm talking to a supervisor or it, even if it's not a supervisor it's anybody that's accused of doing something wrong and then you know right away they'll be like well i never do that had i known that i would have stopped and i agree i think most people if you tell them hey knock it off that's making me feel uncomfortable they're pretty much going to stop right we, we're not going to work to make people feel uncomfortable but until now most organizations have made it hard for anyone to even speak up right look at the retaliation mm. complaints mm. Right. interesting i mean you talked yeah, about we're gonna we're, sure we're gonna take a short break and i want to come back to civility and see if it's um got that you know civil having that broader aspect of other people weighing in when they see someone doing something so we'll we'll take a break we'll pay some bills and we'll be back in about one minute with sage off background Aloha, I'm John David Ann, the host of History Lens on ThinkTech Hawaii. History Lens deals with contemporary events and looks at them through a historical perspective or what we call a history lens. Uh, the show is streamed live on thinktechhawaii.com. Thanks so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. Mahalo and aloha. Hey, welcome back. We're talking with Sejal Thacker and we were talking about civility in the workplace. And um, I wanted to broaden that a little bit and talk, you know, civil is like, to me, you've got this, this community aspect to it. Uh, sounds sort of governmental, but it's the community. And so, you know, when we're talking about civil behavior and um, Sejal was, was talking about, you know, I, I may tell a joke that's offensive because I think it's funny, but I'm not aware that someone else is sensitive to that. Um, and so they can let me know and that, that, that can help me to resolve that issue and understand that that's offensive to someone. But what if the third party, what if your fellow worker sees stuff happening or, or overhears stuff that, that they find offensive that wasn't even directed at them? They need to step in too. And, you know, we need to be sensitive to each other's um, sensitivities for, for lack of a better word um, in the workplace. So have, have you seen a, a lot of that awareness changing for people? Do they, do they pitch in and try to help their, 
their fellow worker out because you know as you, you were talking they don't even speak up for themselves very often so you know it's like wow am i going to speak up for the other guy you know yeah well and this is exactly where the organization has to be a critical component to this whole thing yeah. they have to create an environment where people feel comfortable voicing their concerns right not waiting i mean i love it when i'm talking to some ceo or something and then they'll be like we don't have any problems here nobody's complaining and i'm like okay yeah. all right <laughs> that is not necessarily always the case but have you done any surveys do you have any data to support that fact or are you just assuming that because nobody's complaining that you have an awesome work environment, right? Um, and so oftentimes they make the inaccurate assumption. But also I think that as more organizations get educated on this and really see the business case behind why it makes sense to in encourage employees to raise these concerns and complaints and be more proactive rather than reactive. Because if you wait till it's too late, it's too, you know, the culture of the organization is not going to revive a lot of times after the lawsuits filed and plenty of research mm. behind that issue. And not only that, but then, wow. you know, these days are, I mean, we have to take into account that it's hard enough to get a new employee that's qualified to do the job in the door and then you train them, you spend all this money on getting them up to speed. The last thing you want is them for them to walk out the door and go across the street to your competitor and, and use that experience, which is what's happening now, right? I mean, wow. that whole thing sure. about looking at resumes and, and looking for gaps, nobody cares about that anymore. So you have <laughs> to care about your culture in a proactive way. The other piece of it too, that I think we have to talk about is this whole unconscious bias situation because ah. a lot of the a lot of the training that you know I, I one piece of what I do is civility stuff but then there's this whole other side of the coin that I don't think organizations are addressing and you can't get to civility or diversity or even inclusion until you address this unconscious bias and and I you know some people get offended when I use the word bias and so I always say this at every every single time I talk about it that sometimes I'll call it unconscious belief because we're all human beings we all have it and so but there's not good information that employees are that organizations are sharing with their employees on unconscious bias. And so we, we can't talk about intentional behaviors without addressing the unconscious or the implicit bias type of behaviors that we all have. And so that's been another piece of what I think has been missing and why we haven't been able to really make a dent in this harassment issue is because people don't understand unconscious bias. So let me give you an example. And I use this when I do my public, my presentation, it's really effective is, you know, I had a case that I worked on uh, years ago where it was a manager that was um, had a team of eight people and they hired a new female employee. And so there were other females. So it wasn't a gender discrimination or harassment complaint. But what ended up happening would be there would be situations and what she complained about was that during the meetings, the supervisor would kind of go around and ask everybody, how was your day or what, what are you up to? What's the status on that? And then the employees would give their responses. And for whatever reason, whenever he would get to her, he would either skip over her altogether. He would interrupt her when she would be speaking. He, his, maybe his tone would slightly change. Right. And he was wow. kind of dismissive. Of her. And so, you know, anybody in that situation, any one of us would be hello, this is, we start thinking about why is this person treating me this way? And so that happened, right? And so when I got involved, I was called in to investigate this case. And so when I met with her, there wasn't any clear protected category. And frankly, there were other women there. There wasn't, and nobody ever complained about the supervisor before. He had a really good track record. I had no reason to doubt his credibility. There wasn't anything, you know, so we were trying to figure out what was going on. And then I met with him. After I met with her, I met with him. And within literally, I would say 20 minutes, it became obvious that it was an unconscious bias issue. Um, and what I, what I, because unconscious bias is unconscious to us, right? But mostly it comes out in our actions, right. our body language to everybody else. We just don't see it. So it wasn't that hard to figure it out. And what I learned was that when he was around eight or nine years old, 
um, he was obese, significantly overweight, where the doctors had basically said, if you don't lose this weight, you're done in six months. Like, you're not going to be around. Right. So imagine being a child and being told that you can imagine the harassment, the bullying, the comments that he's heard about how he had to lose the weight and how he was weak and how, you know, all of this stuff ingrained into his hardwiring, which is what unconscious bias is. Right. It's beliefs, opinions and things that are ingrained into our brains before we even know it. Most of the time, we don't even know it's there until it comes out as a spontaneous judgment. So so. He had heard that he was weak so often. Well, this woman was a few pounds overweight. So whenever he would look at her, unconsciously, he, oh. he viewed her as being weak, right? Wow. And so we were able to figure this out and resolve it. Those two still work together. They have an amazing relationship. Like we're, But awesome. how many people are going to be able to pick that up? Most people are going to be like, that's discrimination or that's harassment or that's bullying behavior. And, and there's this whole other side of it that if we're trained on it and, and we start with ourselves, right? And, and we start becoming aware of our own biases. Then we can make sure it's not interfering with our interactions with other people or the decisions we're making at work. So this is a huge piece of the puzzle that's missing mm. from most yeah. organizations, you know, and, and, and especially for HR and legal. I mean, I think everybody should be trained on it, frankly, because it's 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 every person individually has to do the work on this. And it's not a one time thing. It's not like you're going to sit down and say, all right, I'm going to take this online tool, which you can take, which I recommend everybody does. It's called the implicit association test. It's free. It's online. Harvard University and a bunch of these other big wig universities put this test together. It's been done by millions of people across the world. And um, it, it's broken out into different categories. And then you answer the questions and then it tells you what your potential biases are. Why wouldn't anybody want to wow. know? Yeah. Sure. And it's a great tool. And, you know, like, for example, look, I took it. Right. I took it and it it gave me it gave me these four questions. And I, by the way, I have a seven year old son. Right. So um, I was taking the gender test and it asked me, OK, so if you if you have a uh, if you have a daughter, would you feel comfortable dressing your daughter in all pink? Yes. If you have a daughter, do you feel comfortable dressing your daughter in all blue? I didn't hesitate. Yes. Then it flipped it, right? And then it said, if you have a son, do you feel comfortable dressing your son oh. in all blue? And then came that last question, right? If you have a daughter, I mean, <laughs> son, do you feel comfortable dressing your son in all pink? And I paused. I mean, that doesn't make me a bad person. That means somewhere along the way, somebody, my mom probably, put it in there <laughs> that boys shouldn't wear pink, right? But it's as simple as that. It doesn't mean yeah. I'm a bad person. It just means... Now that I'm aware of it, and you're, you're, you know, if you're thinking like, why is this important, Sajel? It's your kid. You know, you're, you dress your son in whatever colors you want. Well, it's a lot more complicated than that because if I'm a hiring manager, and two gentlemen walk in, and one has a pink tie on, if I wasn't aware of that bias, who's to say that I might not, you know, give that person the job because of the color of their tie, right? Mm. So. It's something it. that each one of us have to take responsibility for. To un and the good news is that once you gain awareness of your biases and you know what they are and you practice inclusive behaviors, you can start to rewire your brain. That's the good news. It's totally possible. Ah, so, so it is trainable. Do you think we should start with this at a, at a younger age? I mean, could we, would these be effective? I, I feel like a lot of stuff doesn't happen until the workforce and by then people got problems or issues or, or unconscious but all this stuff that's never been called out to maybe they've been bullying people all through high school now they go get their first job and they're acting like a you know a, a bully and they're just unaware because no one called it on it they weren't trained should we should we start this younger should we start it with kids i mean we're getting kids bullying each other online all these other things is this um something that we're missing in our in our training early on with people I, I mean, I totally think so. And actually, they're already doing it. Like, as far as the civility and really? the respect, stuff, my son in second grade has a, a really good program. And lots of I ask that question a lot because I do think it should. Ah. And it's already happening. The piece that's not happening, though, is the unconscious bias piece. And I think there should be okay. some, even if it's at a really fundamental level of just as, you know, just helping them recognize that you might see somebody with darker skin and you might make an automatic assumption because you're not around people with darker skin 
that that's the form of body, you know, just to kind of at least start putting that into sure. their minds so that they don't, they don't go 40 some years before they're like, wait a second, I've got this thing against pink. Right. So yeah. And start to teach each other. Um, all right, well, we've got about a minute or so left. What's, um, if you could wave a magic wand and the workforce was beautiful, um, what do you think, uh, what do you think, uh, would be the one lesson that you, you would work on first to, to get them there as quickly as you could? Yeah. And that's, I love that question. I think, you know, if, if I can do one thing was to just get people's mindset to the point of let's learn to have dialogue with each other. It doesn't have to be a debate. We don't have to agree on each other's perspective, but go into it with the a mindset of doing a dialogue and then come in with the intention to seek a common ground, right? So we're going to have to compromise. We're going to have differences in opinions, but we have to look at what's in the best interest of just treating each other with the dignity and respect, regardless of whether we agree with each other's views or not, right? That we're human beings and we deserve a certain level of respect and just kind of get people to that point. That would be, you know, um, it doesn't mean you always get what you want, you always win um, and, and everything goes like we would want it to be. But if we can get people to that level of just having these conversations. And so thank you so much for having me on here because you know, I think it's it's so important that you're like helping us spread our voices. And I have watched some of your other shows and keep up your amazing work. Thank you so much. Sejo, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And out there, in, in, if you're watching us today, ask questions of other and then listen to their answer and try to understand. There's a lot we can learn about other people if we just ask mm -hmm. questions instead of running our mouth in one direction all the time. Thanks again. I really appreciate it today. It was excellent. Uh, take care out there, everybody. Be safe, be healthy. Aloha.